I just want to give you a sense of perspective as to what they're going through on their side. Do you mind if you take the, the thing out the end? Is it, is it in, yeah, and just plug it right there in the USB ports. Sorry, I'm slacking. Yeah. Okay, so um, we mentioned, we had that whole conversation about, you know, the Constitution put out certain uh, goals for the United States, and those goals drove uh, agencies to be formed, and each of those agencies have certain missions that they're supposed to accomplish. And in order to accomplish those missions, uh, they break them down into piece parts, and then there are program managers assigned to meet each part of the mission. And then those, those program managers have to figure out whether it's something they can do internally with existing government resources or whether they're going to go external with outside resources. So when they make a decision to go outside, um, they have to clearly define what their need is. So we talk about their need from the perspective of what they internally need, but they have to do sort of a compare and contrast of what they really need versus what's available commercially in the marketplace. Um, so there's two ways the government can buy things. They can buy commercial off the shelf. So these are commercial items that are um, uh, meet their need exactly as is. Or the government has some unique um, specification that they need to have addressed that isn't available in the marketplace. In which case, they need to either uh, do a modified commercial item or they need to do some form of um, research and development depending on who the agency is. Some agencies flat out don't do any R&D. So like for example, a GSA, they don't buy any research and development. That's just not their thing. They're all about commercial items. But if you talk about you know, somebody like DARPA or DIA or CIA or any of the secret words we give end with I, they all tend to, to buy a lot of um, uh, specially designed things for the government. So they have to do that business analysis and strategic planning, just like you're doing on your side to figure out how to get involved with them. They're trying to figure out how they need to structure this um, They need to conduct market research. We'll talk about how to do market research. And I want to talk about market research because the kinds of things they do are the same kinds of things you can do when you're preparing your, uh, when you're looking at the market to figure out what's going on. And then they actually have to put together a procurement request. So that's a very formalized process to say, we have got to, we understand what our need is, we understand what's available in the marketplace because we've done this market research, and now we're ready to put together a procurement request. So this is the actual document that starts the funding process. So obviously procurement requests, as we've seen three weeks ago and as we're about to see this coming week, are uh, is a... Um, is a congressional approval process that has to be signed by the president. So these funding requests, these procurement uh, um, requests, become part of the agency's budget. And then when, when the Office of Management Budget asks for all agencies to give them their budget uh, requests, all of these procurement requests are rolled up into that big budget request number. So if you go out to OMB, you can look up at any agency that you're interested in, and you can see all of the things that are in their budget. And then that, that agency's budget, coupled with all the other agencies' budgets, get rolled up into the total federal budget, and then that's what we're debating right now with, between you know, the Houses of Congress and the President. And so the way it's supposed to work, and I say this with a caveat as of reading the paper this morning, um, the way it's supposed to work is Congress is the one that's supposed to um, appropriate where funds are going. Now, the fact like the issue that we're having right now with this border wall, um, in that the president has requested this to be in the budget and Congress twice has said no, uh, if the president goes around and does an um, a, a, uh, emergency funding uh, bill, then that basically alters the course of what, how it normally works because Congress is the one that's supposed to appropriate funds. So, so as of yesterday, what I'm telling you is absolutely accurate. You know that these budget requests roll up, and Congress decides what should be funded, what shouldn't be funded, what laws need to be enacted, what laws um, should be deleted or changed, and then it goes to the president for final approval. The fact that we've got this sort of what's going on right now may be altering how it's done. I, I'm just 
had a question on that actually. So, if, if an emergency is declared, the money is pulled from other construction, is my understanding. So, other contracts are impacted to pull funds and put it in another location. What happens with those contracts? So, depending on which article you read, there's different scenarios that they're trying to So, nothing's reality yet. Okay. But one scenario was um, just go sort of <coughs> scrape through the entire federal budget and figure out where extra dollars are. I will tell you that in normal budgeting cycles, not what we've had, but in normal budgeting cycles, by February, all the agencies are going around to each of their program managers and saying, you, you had a purchase request out for X number of millions of dollars. You've only spent this number. Uh, how much do you really need by the end of the year? And if and the program manager's goal is to say, I'm going to spend it all by then. Because if they don't, then Congress automatically reduces it the next year to what the actual number was. So there's a real big uh, sort of cultural incentive for federal agencies to spend exactly what they said they're going to spend. But uh, when they can't spend those dollars, then the agency itself doesn't want to lose those dollars. So they might reappropriate, like if you're not going to spend all your $4 million by the end, they might give it over here just to make sure that the agency as a whole's budget doesn't get reduced. So the, the first scenario, so that's how it normally works. The first scenario that I've heard about is that if the president exercises executive powers to declare a national emergency, then we're totally out of all this and we're into a totally different budget. Like we're, to we're into crisis, we can throw away the FAR, you know, I mean there's a lot of things that get um, superseded if we get into a national emergency mode. Um, so that's one way that it can be addressed. They're, they're questioning whether if, if this is considered a national emergency, whether he's going beyond his power. So that's the issue with this particular case. The other way that they're talking about funding it is to go through and try to scrape all, so instead of, if you were down four million, instead of your money going over to him in the same agency, it would just get bumped up to this pool that could be used for the wall. Um, so that's the second scenario. And then the third scenario is that, um, and this is what Paul Maine is saying, that there are pockets of money that the president can get to. And to be honest with you, those are, I don't know what those are, but the, but the, and that it would be funded by that. Um, the other scenario I've heard is that it's being pulled from state, homeland security, and one other uh, agency's budget, which means all of their budgets, everything that they said they were going to do this year, that's going to have to get scaled back. Um, so a couple things can happen from the, the answer to your question. The contractors, you know, the agents, so let's take state, for example. They could say, um, we got hit with a 10% budget uh, because it's going to go over to the wall. Uh, so every program manager has to lower their budgets by 10%. So every, you know, they equally spread the pain across all the different programs. Um, if that's the case, then individual contracts might not exercise option years. So in order to um, continue the contract next year, they might decide not to exercise it next year. Or they might decide to cherry pick what they want, what they don't want. So they might say, we're going to keep this whole part of the contract intact, but we're going to remove this part. Or we, you know, we were going to schedule 10 deployments, we're only going to do nine. They can do all kinds of things like that. So that's how they would handle like individual kind of issues. Any other questions? So in other words, what you're saying is that after you try to live within their means for a change, if, they, if, they're, if they're not having to spend the money, if they're spending it just for the sake of spending it, now we're starting to live within our means. Gosh, what a concept. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's so, frustrating as a taxpayer. Yeah, it, no, it, it infuriates me that we waste money just because it's got to be spent or we won't get to spend it next year. Mm -hmm. That's silly. You can't run your life that way. You can't run your business that way. <clears throat> I, I can tell you where I've seen that be a little bit different, though, is on the military side. When the, those funds, extra funds are available, mm -hmm. And they're looking for resources to, uh, or ways to spend it, basically. Then you can increase, like because it's mission based, then you can su you can buy things that supplement the mission to make it more effective. Mm -hmm. Like like for my airmen, we got them a bunch of parkers, right, to get them get them out, and, like when they're out in the cold, uh, to help them out there. Uh, there there were other things that were purchased that helped facilitate the mission, 
because it's mission based as opposed to a but the money was already appropriated. Yeah. You did, it just didn't money. rain money. It was already yeah. appropriated. Well, they just didn't know where to spend it yet. Right. And now they're saying, well, we don't really know, so you're going to buy some parkas. It's not that it was newfound money. Right, but, but you're saying that money couldn't be utilized. Like, it's it's surplus. That was surplus. It, it, we didn't have to buy it for them. No, you didn't. That's true. It could have been sent back. We could have operated more lean, but it helped facilitate the mission. Yeah, it's not like they can go off and buy Buffon hairdos and boats. You know, it's got to be stuff that's tied to right. what it is that they're accomplishing. So what I typically see, and quite honestly, in my training business, I see a lot of training dollars at the end of the year because they didn't have money for training, and now they, they can put some money aside for that. Um, so I, uh, I, I don't want, you know, yes, it was. Yeah, I, I do agree. It's all, it's all designed to supplement the need. And, and let's keep in mind, you know, we can poke fingers at the government, but when you think about, uh, let's say you want a contract and you're supposed to um, have 20 people uh, doing a specific task uh, by month two of the contract, and you do the best job you can to try to hire people and you can't, you only get 10 in. Well, those 10 people's salaries were budgeted. And, you know, it's not the government's issue that you did, weren't able to fulfill that requirement. So, so it's, it's both sides that cause these sort of disconnects with in terms of funding. But I hear you. I don't you know. I, I don't. I haven't seen the government, in my experience, self buy things willy nilly. And when they do, like for example, uh, did you remember the um, GSA boondoggle to Vegas? And there were um, there was a government official and a contractor in a bathtub with bubbles and champagne, and that picture made the front of the Washington Post, that was a good day. Yeah. <laughs> um, that single event impacted travel, education, conference attendance to this day. And this probably happened like five years ago. It has had a significant effect um, because the government was so horrified that that happened that they, like, agencies that weren't even related to GSA were stopping travel. And, you know, nobody could use the word conference. And, you know, you had to be going to some form of training and it had to be specifically tied. Like, you couldn't get that general knowledge kind of training anymore. You had to get the, okay, you're contract level one and you're now going to be a contract level two and what do we have, but nothing in addition, like no business expertise. So when they have events like that, they really, in my experience, they really kind of, uh, um, and then, you know, the other issue you have is when you have, like, people that are, uh, you, you have two different kinds of executives in the government. You have the ones that have grown up through the bureaucracies, and you've had ones that are appointed by each of the presidents that come through. And the ones that have grown up through the, um, the ranks know things like, you know, you wouldn't, you would buy a desk like this for your training rooms. You wouldn't buy, you know, $30,000 tables for your conference rooms or things like that. And so these appointees that come in from business, and this is across all administrations, um, when they think that they, you know, in their mentality, you know, desks look like power, that they want to uh, make sure that they uh, are, you know, presenting themselves to clients in the best possible light and it's very powerful and they, they use a lot of the trappings of the office. Well, when they try to take that same mentality and take it over to the government, that wreaks havoc because it's just, it's different ways of running businesses, uh, business versus government. Okay, so by this point, they've also analyzed their requirements. And um, when I talk about requirements analysis, I'm not just talking about the individual procurement. They're looking at the procurement both what's needed today and what's needed in the future. Um, so, so let me give you an example. Um, Homeland Security asked me to come in and help them with the source selection plan. And the, the uh, plan was for, or the, the, the procurement was for the system that's used when you go to the airport and you give them your passport. They do a quick check to see if you're on the good list or the bad list. And that same system is being used by um, uh, State Department to do your passports. So when you send in your passport information, they usually tell you it's going to take about six weeks for you to get your passport back. So they have a very long lead time to to verify whether you're a good person or a bad person, right? 
Um, or if you've done bad acts or good acts. Um, if you're at the, at the airport, the government has to, you know, has to meet that requirement very quickly, within seconds, because otherwise all the flights would be delayed. So that same system is used for both. So the question that the State Department was struggling with was how much, inf or Homeland Security was struggling with, is how much information do we give contractors about what we're doing? So do we tell them, you know, the system is currently used for um, the State Department to check uh, for passports, and it's also to do passport control at TSA, or do we tell them that the overarching plan is that all the states and localities and cities in the country will also be tapping into the same database? And do we also let them, and then from DHS's and, and State Department's perspective, future, what is it that they're, what's their vision for how security is going to be handled? Now, how much of that do we want to let companies know? That's what they struggle with, because if they tell them their entire plan, where is that entire plan now? Out there. Right. Not only do, con you know, valid contractors that need to know the information have, but so do all the terrorists, because everybody can access FedBiz Ops. So then, if on the flip side of that, if they don't tell contractors everything, when the contractor wins the business and they design a system to be this big to handle State Department and TSA, and they get in there and the government says, oh, no, 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 the system you designed, it needs to be 10 times bigger, well, then they can say, well, we should be able to do, you know, contract mod after contract mod to be able to come here you can tell us the full scope of the requirements. And not only that, but let's say I win the contract. Well, all of you at that small level contract, all of you now have grounds to protest. When you start seeing that my system isn't just this big, but it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, because you can say, wait a minute, if I would have known this contract was going to be this big, I would have bid it totally different, and I would have been, I would have been the winner. I would have been much more cost competitive. But you, government, didn't tell me the full scope of the requirements. So when, when we say requirements development, it's, it's not just, oh, let's just figure out what, exactly what's in this little box. It's much bigger than that, and and then because it's it's in the context. Okay, so so the box could be different sizes. The second thing that can happen is that you have to look at that requirement in the context of everything else they're doing, because sometimes, oftentimes, there's a lot of interoperability kind of issues or a lot of integration issues that if they don't share up front, you can't develop a, a, an effective solution. And then finally, even the requirement itself, they don't just look at it as your purchase price. So let's use an example of light bulbs. You know, so we have two different kind of light bulbs. We have the old traditional ones, and we have the squirrely ones. So which ones are um, most cost effective when you buy them? When you buy them? No. Mm -hmm. But if you say um, these lights have to be on for 10,000 hours, and you figure out how many light bulbs you need to be able to handle 10,000 hours, what will you typically say? Which one being more inexpensive? Right. No, they're squirrely ones. Use a, ter use a technical term. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so that's a very easy example, right? Uh, if the government just paid attention to your purchase price, they would go with the old traditional light bulbs. But if they're look they have to look at the life cycle. And the life cycle would show that the, the LED light bulbs are much more um, cost effective. So when you think about what you're offering, it's not only the purchase price, it's how much it's going to cost to maintain that over time. So if you, if you sell paint, you have a choice. You can either sell, and we all know, there's some paint that is just not good. You know, you put it on and you can still see everything. You can see all the bumps and stuff from before. Or you can buy a, a, a better paint and you can put one coat on and you're done. You have a choice as a contractor as to which one of those that you're going to present. If you, if you present the lower cost one, chances are you'll win the deal because you'll be the lowest cost provider. But on the same token, um, you know, if the government's not going to be as pleased with your solution because, you know, it's not going to look as good. So you have those choices to make and the government has to evaluate where they're getting them. But because, again, they're trying to make the most efficient use of taxpayer dollars. Um, they're also looking at the extent of the competition. You know, who are the possible sources for doing this? You know, um, 
they, they have to make sure they get at least three vendors. Um, if it's